the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. A social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Rue saint Ursule by James Gifford. I'll be reading a travel narrative called Rue saint Ursule about being in Toulouse in Occitania in southern France. While there, I ran into a Canadian writer, Guy Gavriel Kay, and bought some novels by Ursula K. Le Guin, including The Dispossessed. I also have to apologize for my French pronunciation. I had to laboriously change my pronunciation when I was a music student because many silent parts of spoken French are vocalized in sung French, so I'm now hopeless at this point. What's not hopeless is the idea that creative work can embody anarchist theory and practice without necessarily naming it. And that can happen in children's books, comics, films, and even mass-market genre novels. Part of what drives this piece, and that relates to an anarchist perspective, isn't simply running into Le Guin's great anarchist novel in translation into Toulouse. It's her science fiction idea of the Ansible, which is a narrative device for instantaneous communication created by her anarchist protagonist, Shevak. But Ansible is a funny word. It comes from answerable, which is what the device makes everyone. People become part of a community that is answerable, meaning what they do is known to others because instantaneous communication is possible. In other words, it's a call for community in a novel about social anarchism. I'd also just finished a book on anarchism and fantasy fiction when I took that trip. That's a modernist fantasy, Anarchism, Modernism, and the Radical Fantastic, from ELS Editions in 2018. Part of my assumption in it, and also here in this story, is that anarchism is more readily found in the form, structure, and style of popular narratives than it is in explicit slogans. So the radical potential in fantasy literature was already on my mind. That long anarchist arc in the genre runs from William Morris's fantasy novels, uh, what we call his late romances, and especially Ruth Kinna's recuperation of anarchist themes and Morris's radicalism, through to the modernist poet Hope Merlis's fantasy novel, Lud in the Mist, uh, all the way through Mervyn Peake's Gormenghost, which he directly linked to the anarchist New Romanticism movement, and onward to Le Guin's Earthsea books. There are many others along the way, but that supposedly unlikely combination of fantasy, anarchism, and modernism drove my thoughts. Along with it was the peculiar feeling of nostalgia, which is usually thought of as a reactionary sentiment. This is partly why the fantasy genre gets described by critics as inherently conservative, despite anarchist authors like Le Guin or Michael Moorcock or Margaret Kiljoy thriving in it. So I wanted to write about nostalgia's once-again structure as something that can disturb or discomfort the present, not simply pacify or console us. It's bound up with Simon Critchley's politics of disappointment and his idea that philosophy begins not in a sense of wonder, but in disappointment. The feeling that something fantastic has failed. And so we're living through that unsuccessful attempt at something better. It's an approach to anarchism that dodges the problems of authority implicit in prefigurative politics or utopianism. Prefiguration, just like idealizing the past, sets up a path, a way, a canal, or a corridor that you can't step out of. Instead, I like to think about how we can turn backwards, or stand still for a moment, or best of all, step off the pathway and make our own desire paths. You know, where people trod down a new pathway by walking around a barrier, or making their own shortcut that cuts off the sidewalk. And I love how in French there are les chemins de désir. It had me thinking about Occitania, the Basque struggle for independence, the history of Toulouse as a city, and how Henri Lefebvre had written there, including the critique of everyday life. In other words, moments of suspension in the interstices of power. 
It's small moments of freedom in the here and now that don't console us about reality, but produce radical disappointment with the world as we find it. Wrapped up in that is the shaggy dog ending of The Dispossessed, as well as her earlier ending for The Tombs of Atuan. Nostalgia, as a word, comes from nostos and algos, that is, home and pain. It's that moment in the present of turning back toward home, knowing that home is already past. And I think the question is how we balance between fantasy in memory of the past and fantasy in the utopia of the future. How do we instead inhabit that moment in the present? And how does that algos, that pain, give us the fuel of a disappointment that can be transformative? That is, transformative in a way that the consolatory ideal of fantasy of past and future can't. We don't need to be consoled. We need to be disappointed. Those are all moments of being in the present. And we know Le Guin gave a lot of thought and, at least for the dispossessed, had discussed it in her correspondence with the critic Darko Suvin. He felt this was essential for her anarchist paradigm. So I kept worrying over memory, verb tense, and how to shift from longing for the past or longing for some utopian future to, instead, walk a path of, uh, not to, freedom by inhabiting the present. So here's my story. My thanks go to colleagues and friends in Toulouse who hosted me, uh, to Guy Gavriel K for being very kind, and of course to the Rue saint Ursul for being a space for my own Chemin de Désir. Rue saint Ursul, by James Gifford Toulouse is like some Adonis reborn and reveling in its beauty. This is how it seemed to me walking its streets, slowly remembering the same places and pathways. In Toulouse, History rubs close to the surface, making itself newly visible. You see the beating heart of Aquitaine pulsing beneath the surface. The metro even chatters along the track by announcing its pauses in French and Occitan, carving its path under the rosy earth with the veins of lavender and rue reaching down overhead. It remembers the pink body of the earth because Toulouse is la ville rose, and a visitor's postcard can't leave without some joke about it. Mine did. The local terroir, when its clay is made into bricks, comes up a rosy pink, and wherever you walk it glows in the sun. As it ages, especially with the grid of diesel engines and modern industry, the brickwork darkens to a more familiar hue, but where it's restored or scrubbed or washed clean, that underground rose comes back into its spring bloom, pulling the past back into the present, as fresh as its memory ever had been. I was walking the walled banks of the Garonne, where restoration work called back the pink reflections over the water, and I was crisscrossing the bridges. I had a few days to play tourist and was intent on putting my feet down every path I could between the observatory hill with the Jardin de l'Observatoire to the modern art museum and commemorative garden for the Rwandan genocide and Les Abattoirs. Marching up to the peak of the hill is a battle, but the view over the medieval part of the city is irresistible. The spire of the Basilique saint sernin stands like a thorn a few kilometers away, back to the river nearly. With the luxury of playing tourist, I began marching back to it, to taste once again the light through its stained glass, and then on a strange impulse south again in a winding set of turns to the brick couvent des Jacobins, to inhale the pink glow of late light in the day through its florid rose window. Its southern Gothic brickwork pulled a patina of orange from the pink of the walls of the nave. The green of the cypresses and lawns of the cloister glowed like a bitter rind against its ripeness. My feet felt warmly tired in my old shoes and my legs tired from a day full of walking. This is a luxury harder to indulge at home. I knew the next day would turn to les banlieues, work, and more sitting and talking than playing at being a flaneur. I had two quests to complete in Aquitaine. There was no Eleanor here, though, to make the sparrow and hawk so. I needed a drink, and I needed a book. The book was for my host's son, and the drink was for me, in that order. I'd promised a story of wizards facing their shadow or calming an earthquake with a word, and that kind of promise to a young man must be kept. The drink was pure fancy. A bright weaving for nostalgia. I should enjoy a cure. 
and I already knew the fresh, earthy fruitfulness of a young Bass Armagnac would travel home with me. But, based on a Canadian novelist's advice, I'd ordered a Negroni for the first time on the last night of my previous visit to Toulouse, as a pink drink to salute La Ville Rose. It took root. The book and the drink would both be once again, and Toulouse is a city of bookshops, humble, huge, shadowing, and in-between. All of France is a land for an aperitif. Having immersed myself in both, I could face the irreconcilableness of once and again that muddles nostalgia's bitters. Again would undo once, and the onceness of any experience would make its repetition impossible. I skipped the chain store, Gibert Joseph, and the maze of Ombre Blanche, too, knowing I would go there in the evening to hear a reading. Instead, I went to the black and white signage of Librerie Serebi that I'd seen earlier, specializing in literature de genre with glowing images of la fantasie. Now it was open, and now it was perfect for the relic I sought on the Rue saint Ursule. Inside the left-handed spines and faced covers pointed to the romance of the rose, quests and dragons. I found it quickly. Between the translations of Catherine Kurtz and Alan Moore's New Jerusalem, a meeting stood out where the waters of the Garonne and the earth of Occitania made the rose and fire one in a terre-mer. It was perfect, though for every young reader a book is a choice made, not a gift given. The clerk smiled as I was handing him the book. C'est tout, monsieur? Oui, merci. My terrible accent immediately gave me away. He was grinning at what must have been a well-worn joke. De remer sur la rue saint ursule D'accord, I said, grinning back and handing him my euros. I slipped the book into my shoulder bag as I left the shop and turned north back to Place de Capitale with a thirst. In the Café Florida, facing the opera house a year earlier, I'd been tempted by the drink's champion. The same Canadian author, by some cosmic coincidence, giving a reading that evening. And now I found myself wanting to experience the once again, to let the bitters of the drink be the bite of nostalgia's ache on this visit. It was an odd hour, and the Florida was nearly empty, so I was seated at the front looking into the plaza. I had the feeling that I sat in a 19th century painting of Paris, except the grey colours were all rose, and there was no way to mistake Le Capitole as anything but Mediterranean. Un necroni, s'il vous plaît, I asked. The waitress went to the bar. I took out my notebook and papers from my bag, as well as the new book, to read just a few pages before it went to its new reader. Even in the French translation and my weakness in the language, I was caught by it. Immediately I was feeling the slowness of being, of standing in the small town of my childhood with the smell of cedar and pine while reading in the backyard or park, and the thick smell of coffee and cigarettes in the worn-out used bookstore run by the three retirees, the three Maudrebed, as I thought of them, aunties helping me to the books I probably shouldn't have. In the book, the young boy, the small town, the hills thick with trees, it all came racing back. Pas de monsieur. I looked up. It took me a moment to refocus. No Negroni, monsieur, she helped. Un kia? I agreed, though part of me was disappointed. The sharp pucker of cassis and its cloying sweetness was not the same kind of mystery of flavor to solve. The wine for Kier could vary widely, but the cassis already had a place where it began and a place where it ended for me in styles. When the Kier came, the wine was sweet, adding to the cassis. It was hard, though, to dispute the warm November sun that played across the square and the pleasures as I went to a book like an old friend, even if I was reading slowly and filling in unfamiliar words half by memory of the English edition that was sitting on my shelves at home. Besides, old friends don't need to finish their sentences, and you can sit with them for quite a while in blissful silence. There is no doubt now. As I was finishing the aperitif and leaving the euros for it on the table, I decided to pick up the rest of the book in the series to leave behind me after returning home. I packed up my shoulder bag again and was marching out into the brisk air, turning down Rue La Gambetta and from it down Rue Saint-Ursule. 
At the point where Rue Gambetta curves south and Rue Mirepoix cuts off north, my phone gave it sharp bzz, bzz in my bag. I stepped off into the alley to dig it out while wandering closer to the foreign language bookshop that would host a reading that evening by another Canadian. Maybe I'd tell him there wasn't a Negroni to be found. Maybe he'd know where I could get one. The phone lit up a message from home, an audio text from nine hours earlier on the Pacific, but only seconds before my afternoon. We were sending these short recordings by text messages rather than paying for calls. I pressed it to my ear, expecting a good morning. I wove you, Daddy. You're the best, Daddy. I ate all my breakfast, so I get to have Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And have you gots me a toy from French like a robot? I wove you, and you're the best. I stepped closer to the entrance to Ombre Blanche Etranger to seek out a quiet, shaded spot to record my answer. To be answerable instantaneously was still unfamiliar to me and a five-year-old nine hours earlier in the day, able to instantaneously reach out and grab me back to reality, gave a feeling like time travel. I was set thinking of the thousands of miles of gutta percha wrapped cables stringing across the Atlantic and the signal boosting of the telegraphs that would tap out cables to crawl their way from finger to finger around the world as bits of text. The leap of my finger holding down a microphone icon that could answer a message across space instantaneously seems like a science fiction fantasy. I found myself looking disorientingly in the window, seeking the chairs that were already set up in the back of the shop in readiness for the events of a handful of hours later that evening, but my face superimposed over it in reflection. Daddy loves you. I'm so proud you ate your breakfast. I don't have a robot, but I do have claque d'oie for you. You'll find out about them when Daddy gets home. I miss you. I tuck the phone in my back pocket. With the feeling of always coming home, wanting to be on the Pacific in that early morning with the sunrise in my sun. A bright tapestry hung on the brick of the wall inside. No, it was a poster of a tapestry, ripped at the edges. This worn fraying made it difficult to say where the books ended and the layers of brick from the distant past took over. Red here and there, but mainly still that soft pink hue where it is worn or has been scrubbed. I turned from the alley window back to Rue Gambetta and walked south to where it crossed Rue saint Ursule. I went back into the store with the jingle of a bell and went straight to where I knew the telling would be shelved. There was a six-inch gap of empty space. Not just the second volume was gone. Every title was taken. I went back to the clerk and tried to explain what I was looking for, haltingly. I am sorry, monsieur. She is gone, he said, switching into English for me. She is gone now. Je suis désolé. This is bitter, but what could he do? What could I do? I had a farewell dinner to attend, and time was against us both. I could tell the tale to my friend immediately, but the physical tale itself could only move so fast. I would be gone, too, by the time it could arrive. Merci, monsieur, I said, adding, merci beaucoup. And with that, I left to meet colleagues and friends back at Place du Capitol. It would be a swank event, third floor in the luxurious two-store dining room of Brasserie Les Arcades. It was meant to be the high point. I arrived, but they were all outside. My friend was standing with the others, and she used the exaggerated face of British desolation. Her eyes looked at me over the rim of her glasses. They say they're not ready. We have to wait three quarters of an hour. She made the French expression I can only suggest as and pointed questioningly to Café Florida, turning down the corners of her lips as a question. I nodded while everyone else shrugged. We wandered, following, two doors down to it, and after a conversation too rapid for me to follow, we were led in and led back, past the table I'd occupied twice before, then to the spiral staircases at the back, and up we all went. What we emerged into was... horrific. Imitative sketches of giraffes set between postcard pictures of Africa with dark stained masks, most likely made of French oak or even more likely Swedish pine, hung on the wall over brown sugar paint and ebony-colored laminate flooring. Imagine what an anthropologist's autoethnography of this could be, I wondered, while also worrying. We had cramped seating, despite the room being empty, but we were seated all together, 
The bartenders came to us with a pencil and a scrap of paper in hand. After Kier, then Kier, then Kier, and one Southern Comfort sur Glacé, my moment came. Une Negroni, s'il vous plaît. I was answered only with a nod as she moved on. We all chatted excitedly over the day and all that had happened. I was expecting pas de. I was expecting cassis. Instead, I was served a dragon's breath. It was a Negroni, in a pint glass, with four ice cubes, filled to the white line of the pint, a quarter orange atop it. Evidently, this is what an American would have meant, or so I imagined the server thinking. My colleagues were looking at me a little strangely for a moment until I said, This is a Canadian pour, at which they all began nodding sagely, just as I was doing innumerable times during the previous two weeks. Oh yes, oh yes, of course, I'd been mumbling seriously, but I secretly knew that I would struggle to finish this fiery beast. I don't know the vermouth or gin, but the herbal bitters and sweetness were dancing. Gentian was sharp and full with juniper and citrus like some tincture of an ice-cold stream flowing its pathway onward. Sage and rosemary hinted in the aftertaste of the lemon and orange, vanilla telling me this was a genevere. The rose-red color thinned as the ice melted, and we were all chatting, glowing like a rose anchor rooting us to this place, this moment. Toulouse was making it all sing like amrit nectar on the tongue in an immortal nunc stans, like a step along a pilgrimage holding the past to the future and tethering us all across distance, being together. When I went finally to hear my fellow Canadian talk about Les Chevaux Celestes later that evening, it was with a filled belly and glowing face, and all seemed right with the world for the moment, all good on its long, winding road. I did tell him about the Negroni, but I don't think I could say what it meant to me. I added his book to the incomplete series I had for my host. I laughed at his jokes, and I hoped the young reader for whom these books were meant would see the passing of generations at work. But I knew... Even as I was coming home that evening under the clear, cold sky with a superabundance of stars, that what I really want is to always walk upwards, in the now, not the once again, even with a desolation of the past's palpable absence, to feel my feet now on the smooth stonework of the Rue saint ursule Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.